Um, so this stuff's up there, by the way. This stuff is now available on your OneNote, Unit 4, Topic 1. The first uh, four, probably first two weeks worth of work is available. So have a look at it. Um, so here's some stuff that you already know. Let's do example one and recall how to integrate e to the 2x plus 2x dx between the boundaries 2 and 0. Who would like to give me some first steps on this one? And you got it. Chris, go what? <laughs> I've got my hearing aids tuned to just listen to people that are actually telling me appropriate answers, and I've just heard this. I oh, sorry, I didn't hear you, mate. Um, so there's our there's our integral. What do we do with that now? Yeah, thanks. E to the 2 times 2 over 2 plus 2 squared, and we subtract from that the, subtract the um, substitution of the lower bound, E to the 2 times 0 over 2 plus 0 squared. Now, you might recall, hopefully, from methods that it's if you've got a polynomial like this term, when you substitute 0, it will disappear, but that's only for polynomial. So be really careful with that exponential. It doesn't just disappear. 0 is an important boundary. So I get e to the power of 4 over 2 plus 4 minus e to the power of 0 over 2. And e to the power of 0 is 1, so it's minus a half. So it's equal to e to the power of 4 over 2 plus 7 over 2. 4 minus a half is 7 over 2. Hmm? Yep, we could factorise. Although that said, and this is really important as well, um, you could write this. We, are, we, we do like you to factorise, and it's important to factorise for look for opportunities to simplify. But when you're actually just talking about a numerical answer, it doesn't matter as much. If, we had, if this was an algebraic answer with a plus C, then I'd expect you to factorise and simplify. But a numerical answer doesn't really matter. Um, you could evaluate that, but in specialist maths, unless it's a contextual question, unless it said, you know, this was finding the um, minimum length of a pole to make a bridge or something, we don't need to actually have an exact decimal answer. Just leave it like this. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy with that answer. Any questions on that? So you need to, this is all assumed knowledge. All that methods integration, assumed knowledge. So let's talk about modulus functions. This you'll need to know as well. Um, what's the modulus of seven? The absolute value of seven. Seven. What's the absolute value of negative seven? Seven. What's the actual value of negative eight? It's an A. It's an A. <laughs> what's, the, what's the absolute value of negative A? Okay, so. Okay, the answer is A, but only if A is greater than or equal to zero. The answer is negative a if a is less than zero. Take a second to think about that. So I've said, what is the absolute value of negative a? Well, if a is a negative number, you've got to be very careful with that type of question. So if a equals eight, you get the absolute value of negative eight equals eight, so it equals a. If a equals negative eight, you get the absolute value of negative negative eight, which is equal to the absolute value of eight, which is eight, but that's not a. A is negative eight, so then therefore it's equal to negative, so that should be eight. So if you get an algebraic response, and this is where we're leading here, you have to be really careful with the algebraic representations in modulus form because depending on whether we've got a domain and that domain says only whole, um, positive, yeah, positive numbers, then um, we've got an issue. So what's important there? That was leading to that question. The last one here, what's the modulus of 3 plus the modulus of negative 3 minus the modulus of 3? The answer is 3. So you get 3 plus 3 minus 3 is 3. Cool. Happy? So we know how to use this negative, and the way we use that negative is different to the way we use this negative. 
Cool. So that's example two. Part C was probably the most important part. Um, this this comes up in methods a little bit, but we didn't we didn't talk about it too much. Um, but why does the derivative of log x equal to y to, um, equal one over x? Okay, so um, we're leading on to this, and I've got it set up here. Y equals log x, and x equals e to the power of y. We're going to do a lot of work on differential equations and specialists. That's topic two. So if we can work out dy dx, we can also work out dx dy. When you derive e to the y, you get e to the y. And so therefore, dy dx equals 1 over e to the y. But remember that x equals e to the y it comes from there. So that's 1 over x. So that's just using that uh, and, uh, reciprocal of the derivative. And we can do that. So there's a couple. There's just a few little links I need to set up before we do this topic. Um, it and like I say, it comes up in methods, but it's not really important that you know why in methods. So we tend to lead that a little bit more in specialists. It's going to be important that we can follow a process like this as part of our work. Does anyone have any questions about that? Now we're going to take it a bit further. Zane, you, you had your hand up like this. You know, you know what that means generally in a classroom, don't you? <laughs> um, let's take it further. If y equals log x, do y dx equals 1 over x? What if y equals log of negative x? What does do y dx equal? 1 over Negative x. Times by the derivative of negative x, which means it's equal to just 1 over x. Okay, do you agree with that? So that means that the integral of 1 over x dx is equal to either if x is greater than 0, it's equal to log x, and if x is less than 0, it's equal to log of negative x. And the good news here is that you can't do log of a negative number. So if we're defining that if x is less than 0 and is equal to log of negative x, that actually fixes some problems for it. Um, what it also means is this. All of a sudden, and you might have seen this in your work in methods, you might have seen that when you integrate a 1 over x or 1 over 2x plus 1 or a function like that, you get log of and there's modular signs. They appear sometimes. Again, in methods, it's not really that important that we're using those or we're, we're toying with them, but in specialists, it becomes important you understand why we do that and you start to use it, that modular sign. If you integrate 1 over x, you get this. Another little aside to this, which I'll just do over an aside here, is that if you've got a function, 1 over x, it looks like this. And remember, the integral of that function is the area. So if I integrate the function between here and here, that represents an area. If I integrate the function between negative 2 and negative 1, it represents that area. Now that area there, if you calculate it, because it's below the x-axis, will come out negative. So if you integrate 1 over x, you get an area of log of x, but we do log of modulus of x, which means instead of using 2 and 1, we're now negative 2 and negative 1, we're using 2 and 1, so that side for you guys, and producing a positive area. Um, and it makes sense that in the past we would have got log of negative x, which you can't do because you can't do log of negative a number. Um, but now we can do it. It makes sense because it should exist. You can see the graph. There is an area. It does exist. So there must be an answer. And so do that backwards working on what happens when we derive log to get this integral definition for logs is a really important feature of what we're doing. Um, Oh, yeah, and I wrote this just because as I was writing these notes, I was thinking, some of you might be thinking, how come we're doing this thing from over here in maths and this thing from over here and this thing? And that there is a, a method to my madness in that respect. Any questions? Okay, cool. Um, example three, what's the integral of 1 over 3x dx? Takers? ln 3x like this, plus c, plus 3. 
on divided by three. I might write it like this, if that's all right, because I've haven't used my space very well. But yes, thank you, Emily. So when we integrate it, we have to divide by the derivative of the inside function. And so we get one third ln 3x, but we now use those modular signs to show that if x is negative, well, we can just take the modulus of that and do log of the positive version. Um, that's example three, which I left in an inordinate amount of space for. Here's example four. Let me know how to do that. Yes, oh, that's good because I don't. Okay, tell me. Uh, it is. Can you integrate a quotient or a question? So, um, well, the answer to your question, Max, is that the quotient rule looks like this, and I'll come back to you if that's all right, Dylan. Uh, v dash u over v squared. So, if you can find a function that you're integrating that has something squared on the bottom that is also on top within two terms. So to integrate the quotient rule, it has to be in the, the quotient rule side of things. It can't just be u over v. It has to be in that because you differentiate u over v to get this. So you integrate this to get u over v. So it has to be in that form. That, and it, it can be done. Don't get me wrong. You might find a situation like that, but it's going to be hard to spot. And it's going to be hard to pair that off. So we will get back to that quotient rule stuff. But for now, um, this one can be done, and I just want to make sure that you're aware that if you see a question like this, let's expand the top. Over 9x dx, which can be written as the integral of x squared over 9x dx. I don't have to split it up, but I'll split it up anyway. 6x over 9x dx plus the integral of 9 over 9x dx, that's equal to the integral of 1 ninth x dx plus the integral of 2 thirds dx plus the integral of 1 over x dx. So I've, I've really overworked this question. You wouldn't have to show this level of working. And that's equal to what? 1 18th x squared plus 2 thirds x plus log but now of the modulus of x plus c. Is that okay? At this stage of the game, you're always looking with, if you've got a denominator that is a nice, easy polynomial, and you've got a numerator that's a messy polynomial, just look to divide that numerator over the denominator into separate parts. So that they're the types of questions you might see. And this is going to get a bit harder to spot when we get further through the exercise because we do some work on partial fractions. Um, and example five. How do we find that area? I've left no space for this answer. Yes. So if I'm integrating that, hopefully you can see that this becomes square bracket. This three is not important, so I'll keep that three out, but I get log x plus one, and then I've got a three there, and the derivative of x plus one is just one, so that's fine, minus 3 log x minus 1, and that's between 5 and 4. It's not an area question, it's just a definite integration question. So I'm able to just simply um, integrate and not worry about x intercepts and that kind of stuff. And so I get this 3 log of the modulus of 6 minus 3 log of the modulus of 4, and then Subtract from that the lower boundary, 3 log of the modulus of 5 minus 3 log of the modulus of 3. And it doesn't simplify nicely. Maybe I should have chosen different boundaries. And I get, um, it's just 3 log 6 plus 3 log 3 minus 3 log 5 minus 3 log 4. Can I simplify that? 3, and then it's log, and a 6 and a 3 mean I get 6 times 3. 5 and a 4 means I get 5 times 4 in the denominator. And it becomes 3 log 18 over 20, which is 9 over 10. Okay? Easy? Yeah. 
Every step of that log law to simplify? Yeah. Well, I'm um, I'm dividing, so this is like it's like minus three log five plus three log four. Yeah, so basically you're subtracting both of them, which means you're dividing by both of them, which means they both end up in the denominator. But if you divide by something in the denominator, it's like multiplying it on top. So once it's in the denominator, that division's already happened, and it's got to just be multiplied to be part of that. Okay? Um, what's the issue here, though? And this is something we have to be careful of. What's the issue there? X can't be, so this is an important point you have to look for. Chris and Max, I hate to call out names on a video, but I've just done it. Not my fault, yeah, pretty much. Um, this is really important. So if you're doing an integral, a definite integral, we have got a problem here. Even though we're not calculating an area, those two values can't exist, and therefore on a graph, they are both asymptotes. So even though we're not calculating an area, the, the function doesn't exist at that point, and yet the boundaries of our definite integral go over that point. Does that make sense? So if we actually wanted to do this integral, we would have to split it into three parts, and we'd have to use a limiting argument because we can't integrate at one or negative one. So we'd have to then introduce a limiting argument for as it approaches one from below, as it approaches one from above, and break it right up, which we're not going to do now, but I want you to be aware of that problem. Generally, what's going to happen is the textbook is not going to ask you questions where that is a problem, and it might come up in a practice exam or a formula or somewhere where um, that's something you have to deal with as part of the question. Okay, so just be aware of that. I would be particularly aware if you're doing an integration that involves a log, the asymptote is typically at zero. So if you find that your two boundaries go over that zero, um, then I'd definitely be looking for that. But in any case, I'll be looking, what can x not equal, and is that within my boundary? And if it is, then you've got a problem. Okay? Um, that's 11a, and it's 12 and 9, so I'm going to leave you there.